So, though, though we may not have realized it, all that we've been doing up until now is is trying to build an analogy between one-dimensional algebra and higher dimensional algebra, right? So in one-dimensional algebra, I have a really simple equation. I have ax is equal to b. a is some number, x is some number, b is some number. Well, I've got the corresponding situation in, in matrix algebra, ax is equal to b, right? Where now x is a column, b is a column, and a is a square matrix that I'm multiplying by. So in this situation, we know exactly what's going on, right? For any right-hand side, we know exactly the conditions on A such that this will have a unique solution, right? So we're, we're interested in existence of unique solutions. To this for any B. Right, so we're so x is our solution, x is the unknown, and we want to solve for it. And we want to know when this existence occurs, right? The analogous notion here is non singularity. Right? But this is equivalent to over here the fact that we can perform cancellation and everything will work out. And what's, what's essentially the same thing here? Well, cancellation, you can kind of think of this as an algorithm, right? An algorithm where I'm, I'm asking, can I remove A from both sides of this equation? And the analogy here is really Gaussian elimination, right? Or Gaussian elimination, more accurate, accurately, perhaps. Uh, and so the same, the same thing over here is going to be that A is a full rank, right? Right, so this this tells me exactly when I can perform cancellation, so I want to know when I can perform cancellation. And A A is a full rank means that I can carry out my, my Gaussian elimination, right? So cancellation over here is elimination of A, and this says when I can carry out elimination. And we've seen that these things are the same, non-singular, if and only if A is a full rank. Well, we know exactly when we perform, can perform cancellation, right? It's when A inverse exists. In this last section, well, we talked about exactly what, what this is in matrix world. So this is A is invertible. Right? Well, we didn't exactly have this arrow, right? We showed that, in the last section, we showed that A is invertible if and only if A is non-singular, right? Is a non-singular matrix. Well, over here, we've got one final arrow, right? So this is, this is the almost a direct analogy here, right? We've got one more arrow. A does not equal zero. That's all it boils down to. That's all this boils down to is just a simple, you look at the number, does it equal zero, right? You... You simply check what it is. And so what's the corresponding thing here? The corresponding thing here is the determinant of A does not equal 0. And this is why the determinant is important. It basically allows us to extend all these ideas. It finishes our extension of the analogy to the matrix equation world. So, but now we need to define the determinant so that this arrow is actually going to hold. Well, for one by one matrices, right, since we're just trying to extend a one by one analogy, the determinant of A is just going to be equal to A, right? And so obviously, this is going to reduce to the one dimensional case, right? But what about two by two matrices? Well, we've seen this number pop up, and so it's no surprise that the 2 by 2 determinant is going to be A11, A22, minus A12, A21. 
that's that's no surprise. We've seen that happen a lot. And so the condition is that this does not equal to zero, right? This shows up in the equation, actually, of the inverse that we can compute, of the two by two. But this, so this is an algebraic condition, right? So this is an algebraic number that you computed using the, the entries of the matrix. But the determinant also has a very nice geometric interpretation. And so we're going to briefly discuss that without proof, because the proof is, uh, if, if you, if you want to go through a proof, you can find how to go through it, but it's, uh, it's a little involved for, for one of these videos. So let's suppose this point is the ordered pair A11, A21. So I've just taken the, the column entries, and I've put them as an ordered pair. And let's suppose this guy over here is, say, A12, A22. So I've, I've just taken the second column and I put it as an ordered pair. And whenever I have a situation like this, I have, well, one, a triangle, right? So that's a triangle. But I also have, kind of doubling the triangle, I have a parallelopiped. I mean, not a parallelopiped, I'm jumping the gun. This is a parallelogram, right? And you know exactly the, the volume or the area of a parallelogram. You just you calculate it's essentially a rectangle you just have to figure out what's what's the length of this guy and multiply that by the height and you get exactly the area of this guy well it turns out that this the area of this when I when I fix these two points is actually just this number so that gives us a very beautiful geometric interpretation of the determinant it's when the the columns of the determinant don't flatten out into a degenerate parallelogram. So now, how do we define a three-dimensional determinant? Well, we're going to take this analogy. So essentially what we want to do is say that the three-dimensional determinant is actually going to be the volume of an analogous object to the uh, parallelogram here. Uh, and so to define it, and so what's the analogous object to a parallelogram? Well, that's the, the parallelopiped that I was talking about, or that I accidentally sp spoke of, right? So what does the parallelopiped look like? Right, so now we're in three dimensions, and I'm going to have three columns to my matrix. A11, A12, A13. I've got... A21, A22, A23, and I've got A31, A32, A33. So I've got three points now that, I, that are going to sit out here. So let's say this is, uh, this is the ordered triple A11, A12, A31. So A21, A31, right? So those are the, the column entries, right? Uh, let's suppose this guy is the, our second column, A12, A22, A32. And this guy over here, say, let's say over here, so this is, this is further into the page. Uh, we're going to call him A13, A23, A33. So a parallelopiped... Uh, well, all the faces of the parallelopiped are pa parallelograms. So if we draw this, so so these two points are going to give me a parallelogram. Only now it's a parallelogram that's sitting in three dimensions. These two points are going to give me a parallelogram. these two points are going to give me a parallelogram. And then I have the rest of the parallelograms I have to fill in. And that's it. So it turns out that the volume of this nice geometric object is exactly the following. And we're going to call it the determinant. Well, here's one way to represent it, at least. There are a lot of different ways to actually compute this. Um, but 
this is maybe the simplest thing now. So it's actually a recursive definition, right? So I'm going to compute this determinant by essentially computing uh, two by two determinants inside inside of the matrix. determinant of no, this matrix. So, so notice I'm subtracting there, so it's a little different. A21, A23, A31, A33. So this, this may be completely mystifying right now, but it turns out that this is actually, and you can prove this on your own time if you have uh, some reams of paper that you would like to just destroy. It's actually, it, it could be a good exercise, but uh, it's just it's just the case that this is true, right? And it turns out, in some sense, our two by two determinant was also analogous to this situation, right? Because, right, this is equal to a one one times the one dimensional determinant of a two two minus a one two times the one-dimensional determinant of A21, right? So essentially what we have is we, uh, this supplies us with a recursive definition, and in the next video we'll talk about the full recursive de definition, uh, and that'll be the Laplace expansion. So we're defining the Laplace expansion of the determinant.